I requested. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mahjid Turner. Uh, she is a freelance researcher and lecturer in Muslim theology. She is also the Muslim chaplain for Durham University and the first female Muslim chaplain to be appointed in a university in the UK. She had her degree in social sciences uh, and a degree in uh, social work, mental health, degrees also in various fields of alternative therapies in education, adult teaching, and masters in public health, health sciences, and her PhD is in theology. She has uh, good publications in journals, in encyclopedias, and uh, books also. Uh, which uh, include topics uh, on Sufism, spirituality, and mental health. And her recent book is on Huzun, that is the topic uh, today that she will be discussing, inshallah. And she has been, uh, she was a teaching assistant, mental health uh, act commissioner, and project development officer for Age UK, older people, minority ethnic community and supply lecturer at higher education institutions, community health development specialist. Presently, we mentioned already, Muslim chaplain for Durham University, and she's a freelance researcher and lecturer, co-director of International Foundation for Muslim Theology, and she is also co-chair for Durham University, black and minority ethnic community, and Muslim representative also, an advisor for Standing Advisory Council on Religious Education, and Durham County Council trustee for County Durham Faiths Network, and advisor for County Durham Diverse Women's Group. And more importantly, and above all, she has been a student of the Risala for nearly 40 years, Alhamdulillah, and is still is a student of the Risala. And uh, today, uh, our topic of discussion will be again in relation to the Risala on the concept of Huzun and its relevance today. So I, I am so glad to introduce Dr. Mahjid Turner. Yes, sister, please. Uh, uh, now the floor is yours. Okay. Salam alaikum, if anyone new has joined us. Um, there's been so little written about sadness and what has been written up to date is that uh, it's very mixed up because there's not the definitions there hasn't been any clear definition as to what sadness is so um it's all being kind of lumped in together so what i decided to do is to find out just what one word what meant and that was husn from a quranic perspective Okay, um, is that a background noise or a question? I think it was a background noise. Okay, so um, what I did it to begin with was to do a typology of the Quran to see the story of Huz in the Quran. So I just looked at the word Huz in the Quran and see what it had to say. And then I did a Izutian analysis of the word host in the Quran. That's it, um, basically looking at the semantic field of the word host. That's the relation if the word host had with other words in the Quran, which meant similar things as sadness. And also its opposite. So in order to get a Quranic understanding, uh, um, Tafsir Quran, Bil Quran of, of the word host, and then I looked at to see what Muslim thinkers thought specifically about the word host, what has been written in the area about host. And then I looked at some of the themes that came up with the word host and then examined this by looking to see how the exegetes, the Mufassirun, uh, interpreted those verses to do with host. And then I compared all this with what Said Nursi had to say about us. So it's quite a big project. So with, um, I'll just move this out of the way. The definition 
by Muslim thinkers. Um, generally, uh, the Muslim thinkers are accused of following the uh, Greek and their Roman predecessors about how they define host and how they understand host. But as Al-Kindi says, uh, Al-Kindi is a medieval um, Muslim um, philosopher. He says that he took truth from wherever it came. So I, they actually did follow the Greek predecessors, but they made it their own. It's the same way as we do our PhDs, our research. We use other research, but we add something to it. And the Muslim thinkers did add something different to what the Greek predecessors said. Historically, there's been no consensus, consensus at all on how the word hosn should be defined. This is how Al-Kindi defined hosn as a psychological pain. His words were alame nafsani, sickness of the soul, occurring due to the loss of an object of love or the missing of things desired. In other words, it's to do with loss, loss of anything that's happened in the past. And it needs behavior change techniques to combat it. And he also stresses that sorrow is by convention, not by nature. This means we bring it on ourselves. It's self-inflicted. It's our own fault. It's not so much God-given, it's us who bring inflict sadness on ourselves. Balchi, another ninth century Muslim thinker, uh, was along the same lines, but he made a clear distinction Note, this is um, not, this distinction is attributed to somebody else a uh, uh, hundred years ago to a psychiatrist, but in fact, it was Balchi in the ninth century who made a clear distinction between um, hosn that's due to environmental factors and hosn that occurs for apparently no reason at all. Now, the one that uh, appear, uh, happens because of environmental factors, means external factors, it called, uh, is, uh, is called today reactive. And the ones that happen because of a physical condition is called endogenous. But Balchi made it distinct, this distinction in the ninth century. That means the host actually, he says, happens not because of physical reasons, it happens because of environmental factors, because of how we think about things, how we view things. And it's up to us to change that. And we can train our mind to look, things, look at things differently. And one of the problems, the main problem is that we look at things at face value. We look at things purely on the material aspects of things. We don't look at things beyond the material. We need to look beyond the material, look at the spiritual aspects of things. And this is the problem for us. Now, I looked at the Quran and um, we saw that uh, there were lots of words for, for sadness. Unlike the English translation, if you look at the Quran, lots of the words are just translated as sadness, whereas in the Quran, quite a lot of words, which are, means very close, uh, where, which have distinctive meanings. So, and then I looked at a lot of the words, uh, when I did these words in analysis, of words which had a relation with the word hus, the words like fisk, zol, kof, and so on. And I also looked at the words which were opposite to uh, sadness, which such as happiness, and its relationship with words like taqwa, trust, guidance, reassurance, and so on. So how to obviate, how to get rid of huz? In the Quran, mainly when I've looked at the typology, there were lots of examples of huz related a lot with uh, uh, prophets, and that huz occurred for example, when a Abraham with Abraham and Ismail, when he had to sacrifice Ismail, Jacob's being so uh, loss of Joseph, and also other stories of, for example, Moses, Moses' mother, when she had to uh, part with a baby and, and put her in the river. And Mary, she lost her, um, 
has, has, you know, the most piety, the most important thing to Mary was the piety and the, loss, the thought of losing her piety. So these are the kind of examples in the Quran which gives about horses. In the exegetes, um, so it's about loss, loss of something really, really important and having a huge effect on you as a result. So the exegetes also talk about Hors due to misfortune that has already occurred. That means it's something that happened in the past, but still bothers. It still has a, has a huge effect. So what's the cure for it? How does one obviate? From the Quranic perspective, the only way to obviate hosts is to believe in one God. But how to believe in one God is to submit one's whole self, whole vach, through belief and submission. But no one can be totally and completely at all times submitted in this way, in a sense that the whole vach, vach, in sense of being total sense of ubudiyat all the time. I also found out that Khof occurred with Khof quite a lot in the Quran, which, uh, and Khof is something which relates generally to the future, in particular the hereafter. So just that indicates that in order to obviate Khof, in order to get rid of Khof, we need to believe also in the hereafter. Now, how does Nursi define Khof? Nursi talks about two kinds of host. The first kind he describes as a dark sorrow arising from the lack of friends. That is having no friends or owner, which is the sorrow produced by the literature of civilization, which is stained by misguidance, enamored of nature, tainted by heedlessness. Lucy doesn't use words for nothing. So the words he uses host here is on purpose. The words he uses like literature of civilization, misguidance, heedlessness, ghafla, are all purposeful. And this analogy of this first kind of host, he, he describes it as a sense of being a motherless orphan, being totally disconnected, a feeling of total disconnectedness. His second definition is different. He says, this arises from the separation of friends. That is, the friends exist, but their absence causes a yearning sorrow. This is the guidance giving, light scattering sorrow, which the Quran produces. So this kind of host now is a yearning, hopeful sorrow of what he calls of a elevated lover. So they're both sorrow, but this one is now doesn't feel disconnected. He, the friends are not there, but you do not feel disconnected from them. And it's a guidance giving. So what does Nursi say about Quranic literature, the connection between Quranic literature? Quranic literature produces a, a sorrow, bir huzunu, but it's the sorrow of love. It is a, this, is a, this is the second division, uh, definition, which is a sorrow of love and not of orphans. It arises from separation from friends, but not from lack of them. Its view of the universe in place of blind nature is as conscious, merciful, divine art. It does not speak of nature. So it goes beyond tabi, what we call tabiat. Nusi hates that word. He describes what we see as, as uh, sanat rabbani, not tabiat. And it goes beyond that. So it does not cut that cut off. It doesn't separate. So why do we have those? Muslim thinkers say that we have Hosn because we look at the things around us and we expect permanence from them. We don't recognize that these, everything that we have, all these material things around us are transient. They will finish. But because we seek permanence, in, innately we want permanence, we seek it from transient things. 
And therefore, sorrow is by convention, not by nature. So grief is not God-given. We just bring it on a, onto ourselves because we have this expectation. It's our own fault. And he, we, they like a, this attitude to people who are devoid of reason. Now, what does Said Nursi say about host? He says, the wretchedness of human beings it is due to the misconceived interpretation of creation. We've got the wrong glasses on. We look at the creation, we look at the book, we need to read the signs in creation in the correct way. It's only when we're not reading those signs in the correct way, which we which uh, that's why we get husband because we are not getting the proper manner from it. We cut off the connection. We see it in a manner, it's me, self-referential way, instead of seeing it in a manner, a harfi way, which is connecting meaning in a meaningful way. We're not seeking meaning. We're not reading the signs. And this, his analogy of literature of civilization is the kind that looks at the universe through the prism of nature, looks at matter for what it is. And this results in a worldly sorrow. And this results in that feeling, orphan feeling, ornerless and without hope. And this is what opens the door to misguidance, to refla. And it's a lie. It's not actually the truth. It's telling an untruthful picture, a distorted picture. Whereas the literature of Quran, he says, looks at creation from the point of view of divine art, sanat e rabboni And it results in sorrow still, mind, but sorrow of love, not of orphans, not disconnected. And it points out his signs in all things. There's nothing that happens in our life that is not a sign from Allah. And that connection has to be made at every instant of our life. What is Allah saying to me? What letter is he sending me through this person or this thing or through Corona, through that? Everything is signed to be read in the correct way. So positive horse is in terms of yearning for permanence. So according to the Quran, the key to happiness is um, is the uh, the only means to key to happiness is for the negative host to be obviated because without the connection to divine unity the universe this is how nusi describes it if we don't make that connection if we don't read things in a manai harfi way the universe would look like a house of sorrows a ruin and a place of utter confusion so his terms of self-referential is, 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 is like reducing the value of things, of beings, to the, purely just to the sum of their parts. Whereas Mane Harfi is signs pointing to God. And Said Nusi describes that, seeing the universe as if everything were officials charged with duties and bearing meanings. Now you can imagine now how the world is viewed then when we see everything as officials charged with duties and bearing meanings. So why is Hoz necessary? I mean, although Muslim thinkers say Hoz is a universal condition, but they still say it's bad, you should get rid of it. And they recommend that we should try and get as much of a rid of our possessions as possible because the more attachments you have the more difficult it is to get rid of us the quranic study typology exegesis and is it's all uh, pointed to the fact that us actually is, is is necessary i mean it is bad if you keep it the quran says it's bad you should have it but it's also a means of test and a means of guidance means its its existence is necessary. Nusi tries to explain it in this way with the idea that 
Transience is a necessary undesirable. Only through understanding our own transience that we can understand permanence. So in a sense, we need to go through the journey of understanding, of, of having cause, in order to be able to understand that we shouldn't have it. In other words, he says, in order to get to the kernel, we need the shell first. We need to know the shellness of the shell. Are we, otherwise, we don't want to understand the meaning of the kernel. We need to get to the get know what the shell stands for before we can throw it away. So this process, he calls a process of detaching from the metaphorical beloved in order to reach the undying beloved. So this metaphorical beloved is a, is a process. It's a necessary journey. But the point is, we get hosed because we get attached to metaphorical beloveds without move, moving on. So we can see that analogy with uh, Abraham. We need to, um, Abraham's journey, uh, he, as Abraham did, to the one which is not lost on Sethi. So he was yearning for permanence, but he did examine the impermanent. He did look at the sun. He look, did look at the moon. He didn't just believe. We can't jump into belief. We need to know the, the consistency of impermanence. There are many examples in Nose's journey how through the eyes of misguidance, he talks about himself. It's like a biography of most of his work. He talks about himself, about his journey, how bleak everything it looked. And he says, this is through my Gefla. But then he took recourse to the truths of the Quran, which enabled him to reinterpret those scenarios in a Manoi Harfi way. So Manoi Esmi, actually, this is, uh, what I was trying to say, Manu Esmi is, ac is actually not Manu Esmi and Manu Harfi are not two different approaches. That we should go ma uh, choose Manu Harfi way or uh, not Manu Esmi. Manu Esmi is a process to get to Manu Harfi. So what I'm saying is that the spectacles and misguidance are necessary in able to see things for what they are in order to feel, as Nosy says, our transitoriness, in order to understand permanence, in order to know the shellness of a shell, what it really is, in order to get to the kernel. So, the orphan-like state of husband, in fact, even the negative husband that Nosy, Nosy describes, is perhaps a necessary uh, place to be in order to get to the yearning was state. So what I'm questioning here, well, I have the kind of confirmed in my own mind that again, that self-referential, we shouldn't present Manoi Esmi as if and Manoi Harfi as if they're two different options. Manoi is Esmi is a process to get to the Manoya Harfi. This becomes clear in Anarasana, in which he explains that Anna is a measure, measuring unit. So if we want to know um, that a creator created the whole universe, at the beginning we have to imagine just as I built this house, the owner of the universe must have created the whole universe. Just as I built this house, but then once we've done that journey, we can go back and realize, actually, I didn't build this house either. But that imaginary process or state is at the beginning. We can also liken this to Adam, his inclination to sin. This was for, for him a means to obtain the state of profit. And that something is within all of us. We can connect it to the idea of Felix Culpa. They are happy fall. And this is not the Christian idea of original sin. But without fall, this is what this world is all about. Without the constant fall and getting up, 
we cannot understand, we cannot get up. Without the apparent darkness, we won't be able to understand light. Without mulk, we cannot understand malakut. Mulk is necessary. We can't, these are not two options, mulky way or malakut way. Mulk is a process to move beyond, beyond it and get to malakut. I give an example of a Christian philosopher, a 19th century Christian philosopher, who says that uh, this is Edinger, talks about the necessity of a sense of alienation for the realization of one's impotence. He also says man's extremity is God's opportunity. So if you think about this, the difficulties we have actually is a mercy, like a Quranic, uh, um, you know, um, research that I did, that actually this is the point of where we can get guidance. The test is that the means is a Rahma of Allah to um, means of getting guidance. So Joseph's difficulties were necessary in mercy. They were a test and a means of guidance for him. Jacob's separation from Joseph were necessary. And Hosn is given to us to understand our aptness, our servanthood, our transitoriness. So it's a necessary journey. So if we contemplate on the story of Joseph, now Sayyid Nursi gives the example of this, which is just amazing. He talks about a, a verse in the Quran, Surah Yusuf, uh, 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 101, where he, uh, Joseph went through a lot of difficulties. He fell in the well. This was before his prophethood, but he went to prison. The problems he had with Zuleikha, all these problems he had. All this time, he did not ask Allah to go back to him. He didn't say, relieve me from this world, please take me back to you. When did he ask that? He asked that when he was in Egypt, when he had, he had a high position in Egypt, when his father came back to him and he was well, when his brothers came back, made Toba, uh, said, uh, you know, they regretted what they did and uh, all the family were together and happy. This is the time he asks to go back to Allah. Why? Nursi talks about here hints to the fact that this is actually a more dangerous time that he he can he thought that this is a more dangerous time for him that he could have kefla because he was not put in a situation where he where he would be as much seeking Allah's guidance as his previous positions. Now, if we can compare his situation with our own. Why do we think that we are freer and safer before COVID-19 than we are now? Uh, are we chained, actually, or are we unchained? And I open that to discussion. I hope I didn't go over time. Maybe I can, I can start. Are, are we able to, we can, we can ask questions now? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, okay. Rectify. There are written questions. I will ask them after you. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I always, you know, enjoy um, presentations that are, are about, uh, concepts and, and ideas. We, we don't do that enough actually in, um, in scholarship nowadays. Um, so along those lines, I just wanted to, to make two points, um, and maybe um, uh, suggestions. Um, when, when, you, when you talk about um, uh, who's, um, the, the larger category is, is emotions. 
I think. At least that's one way to, to look at it. In, in modern psychology, there are some basic um, emotions, uh, happiness, sadness, fear, um, um, frustration, uh, shame, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so happiness and sadness are um, you know, two of the basic emotions that are rec recognized in, in modern psychology. Um, so I, I was wondering, you know, how um, um, in, in terms of Islamic tradition, um, how do you think, where do you think sadness um, um, falls? When or what, um, how is it um, classified in terms of the category that it belongs to? But um, more importantly, I, I think we can go further to talk about types of sadness. Um, you mentioned, I think, Balhi um, uh, uh, on the slide, I, if I'm not mistaken, um, sadness uh, or who's was uh, understood as sadness, uh, oppression. But actually, sadness and depression are different things. Um, you know, I mean, uh, depression is a clinical problem. Sadness is not. Um, and then you have, you know, other terms like sorrow, like grief. Um, for example, the, the idea of uh, ram, um, which I guess can be translated as grief, uh, used very much by the Sufis. The Sufis also use host. Um, um, so I think there are differences. Uh, they, they, they might all refer host, ram, and so on and so forth, may all refer to different types of sadness, but they have to be, you know, to be discussed and distinguished from, uh, from each other. Mm -hmm. um, and then my, my last point is that, um, why do we need to talk about who's or sadness? Why is it important in today's um, context? Can it somehow be related to the modern human condition um, and, and therefore to other problems, to other concepts that we often hear about um, when we talk about the modern human condition, the, the idea of uh, meaninglessness in life, um, which is related, of course, to the idea of uh, despair um, or the idea of uh, shakawa, um, uh, the issue of uh, alienation or anomie, um, the, uh, these type of, of issues, which generally have a lot to do uh, at a psychological level with failure of people to adjust uh, to society, um, you know, uh, with um, uh, clinical depression and many other uh, psychological illnesses. So how can you talk about post in that context in order to show that it's necessary, uh, it's a necessary concept for us to think and reflect about the modern world and deal with modern uh, problems? Thank you. Yeah, I think um, I didn't go too much in detail, uh, but there is a chapter on the Zutian analysis of, of the word host, which talks about other words that are used. Um, I'll give you an example of one of the verses in the Quran in which uh, it says that we, it's about the Battle of Badr, I think that's the second battle, isn't it, that they lost. So, and these were believers who went to that battle, but they made a slight ghefla in that they left their posts and they went to collect booty. And it, this resulted in a lot of them dying. And uh, they even thought that the prophet had died, peace be upon him. And so this, they were so upset about this for such a long time. They were just so upset about this that a verse comes to, to say that God gives them calm after calm so that they forget the first host. Now, this, this is the distinction between the first qam and hosn. That hosn must have of the loss of what they, they had there was so great that God gave them qam after qam. So one of our says this, you know, this qam after qam was Allah's mercy in order to make that initial hosn lighter so we can see the difference between the ideas now in, in the Quran. We have so many words that gives the different ideas. They don't lump them all together. 
different ideas of what Hosn is, or what Am is, what Ham is, what all these different words are. So I, I go through this quite a lot in, in the chapter. And then you've got one, one verse about Lot, and I'll read this one to you, I've got it here. And when our messenger, um, our messengers, these are the angels, came to Lot, he was anguished for them. And the word for anguish for them was Sia, and felt for them great discomfort, Vaka. Now these all can be translated as uh, unhappy, sad or whatever. And uh, said, this is a trying day, Asibun. So Sia is, he just felt anguished and wretched because, you know, th th this is happening. This is dangerous situation there with his, you know, the home a lot, you know, if they knew that these uh, pretty boys in the, he didn't know they were angels are here. He felt, you know, anguished for them. So, and then Daka, he was anguished. It means anguished in the sense of powerlessness. He couldn't do anything about it. And then our Sabun, he, he, you know, he found it difficult to deal with. He felt powerless as well. It, it, it's, he felt a sense of what am I going to do, do with this now? So it, a stronger powerlessness there. So this is very subtle differences, which often all of these words can be uh, translated as anxious. So in the Quran, it makes quite a lot of distinction. The main distinction with the word hosn is, is the sadness that's happened, occurred in the past, and it's very strong sadness that we carry with us. That we carry with us, and it's because, and the way to obviate it is because we're not, Nursi says, and the other, the Quranic says, because we're not reading the signs properly. It's our own heedlessness that causes it. But then it's there for us. It is also serves, serves as a form of guidance and a test for us to see it and say, all right, this is affecting me in the wrong way. Now what I've got, to, what have I got to do? This is the S me way. Now what I've got to do, I've got to have recourse to the Quran. So our life, this is what our life is all about, the continuous journey of reading recourse to the Quran, of reading the sign recourse to the Quran. It's not the idea of your normal Muslims, you know, I'm a Muslim now, that's it, I have recourse to the Quran. This separation of Esmi and Harfiz, it doesn't work like that. Mulk and Malakut work together. Harfi and Esmi work together. It's our journey. The fall, not in the Christian term, but we've, we've got to fall and get up, fall and get up, get up. This is the, this is the process is what I was trying to explain here. But if you want a detailed, uh, more detailed uh, understanding of the word Hosni, it would be uh, the Isutian analysis chapter would be useful. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there are two written questions were sent earlier. So I would like to uh, read those. Actually, you can read them in the uh, chat uh, room also. Uh, but uh, I know, uh, uh, Ahmed and Ibrahim Hojas, they are waiting in line also. The first question is the first kind of huzun. I believe this was the lack of friends, uh, as far as I remember, that you outlined more akin to the alienation and disenchantment that modern man feels at the appearance of the vast spiritual vacuum occasioned by the project of modernity and the deposal of God. So this is the first question. The second question by uh, Professor Faris. She, he just wants you to elaborate a bit more on the mulk and malekut aspect, if that is possible. I think Nejatis is more like, uh, he has a, a comment, if you allow me to read it also. Uh, and after you uh, respond to this, uh, then Ahmed will ask his question. He says, I think Nursi in the Masnavi makes it clear that looking at creation in the Manai Harfi aspect is a mistaken way. I am not sure whether we shall say that Manai Ismi is necessary step to Manai Harfi, which you emphasized, of course. I agree that Huzun serves to a great purpose to help us understand our ajis and fakr, 
Thus, it's a great help. So this is just a comment by him. Okay, we'll wait for your response. Okay. Yeah, I think with the first question, definitely the idea of alienation, it's a, um, yeah, I think we can uh, apply that psychological state because uh, Nursi describes it in an orphan-like state. It totally disconnected. So that total connection, disconnection from any meaning. So uh, this, then this feeling of house of horrors and ruin and this kind of description. So the, when the world has no meaning, this is, everything seems pointless. Hence the idea of alienation, idea of suicide and all these things. Um, because we don't see as a, we don't see a connection, we don't see Wahidiya and Ahadiya together. And um, yeah, I think definitely we can link it to the idea of alienation. With regard to Mulkam Malakut, um, I don't know how you want me to elaborate on this. The mulk is tied, is the material side, seeing things for purely from their external aspect, how, how we see it, as Nursi says, just the sum of their parts, instead of the malakut, which is the side, which is the meaning making, or as, the, as Nursi explains, as if everything is a letter, a missive sense. So everything that happens in our lives, everything that we see around here is a bit of a letter to be read and contemplated upon. So that's the kind of Malakut side of things, of that connection, making that connection. Uh, with regard to what was the third creation uh, and Manoi Harfi, sorry, can you give the third one question again? Uh, Oh, all right. Okay. What I would say, I think I probably agree with Brother Nijati, but what I'm trying to say, and I think how Nusi is trying to portray it, is that the mulk or the manai is me is a necessary undesirable. Means if it wasn't there, we wouldn't understand manai harfi. Because it wasn't, it's not, it, it's, it's, its existence is necessary in to move on to Manaya Harfi, then it becomes, a, it becomes a necessary undesirable. Dark, apparent darkness is necessary for us to understand light. You can't, most, Nusi does not get, say milk is no good. He says it's good, go beyond it. In Anna, we have to own before we can disown. We have to fall. So this idea of, two separate, you know, religious, not religious, Esme, Harfi, it's not, to, it's a process more than a um, option of two different things. And thank you very much. Now, uh, Brother Ahmed, Ahmed Ocham, you can ask your question. Please go ahead. Thank you, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank and thank you, Dr. Rashid, too. Uh, as far as I understand from your uh, presentation, it seems that Huzn is a reflection of the state of being in Ghurbe, uh, you know, kind of uh, alluding to the metaphor of Bezmi Ales. So uh, our uh, uh, ontological condition is Ghurbe. So this yields to the feeling of Huzn. Uh, so Huzn uh, may make us going towards, you know, uh, yearning for Jannah uh, and for uh, Allah. Thus, Husn has a positive function in, uh, you know, uh, leading us to think in terms of uh, Manai Harfi and uh, Darul, uh, let's say, uh, from Darul Urbe, Dunya, uh, towards, you know, Jannah, uh, our basic uh, root home. Uh, mm -hmm. In this sense, can you say that uh, the modern secular condition is a kind of uh, a law, uh, loss of husband, uh, uh, the, alien, the spiritual alienation, uh, a face of spiritual alienation is the loss of husband because husband uh, is an exaltation towards, you know, uh, awareness of seeing the transient nature of things. Uh, the modern secular condition even, you know, darkens this side, doesn't have a look at to this uh, uh, way of 
thinking. So he even uh, uh, doesn't have the notion of this person, which is uh, part of, you know, uh, sp uh, spiritual uh, alienation, you can say. In this sense, we have a Musrai Berjeste in Turkish, uh, an uh, Arab Turkish uh, poet, Ahmed Hashim, has such a Musra uh, 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 line, uh, which he says. Uh, Melali tanımaya nesle aşina değiliz. Uh, we don't feel, uh, we feel aliena alienation. We don't recognize the generation who lost the feeling of melal. A kind of, you know, uh, uh, remembering us, uh, husn. I don't know if you can make uh, a bridge or connection between melal and uh, husn. Uh, so my first uh, question and comment uh, on this notion of husn as a loss of, you know, uh, awareness of uh, yearning for the uh, land of, uh, for the Darul, uh, Darul Salam or Jannah. Uh, unfortunately, it is a, uh, so Huzn is an inherent talent uh, or uh, a talent uh, given to us. If you, if we see uh, our state of, you know, creation as a state of Gurbe, anyway, uh, this is the first one. And the second one, I think uh, our way to Allah uh, has different degrees of, you know, uh, difficulties. And in the 24th world, the Deuteronomy describes three ways. Zuhre, uh, Katre, and Rashha. And Zuhre and Katre includes, embraces, uh, you know, Ma'anai Ismi in, in different degrees of, you know, uh, thickness uh, kind of things. So I don't think that uh, it is, a, uh, or it may not be a necessary, you know, evil uh, kind of thing, Ma'anai Ismi, because Ma'anai Ismi uh, may, you know, uh, take you from your road to Allah, as in the case of, you know, uh, Ashq Mejazi. Ashq Mejazi is not a necessary step towards uh, Ashq Ilahi or, uh, you know, divine uh, love. It is just one of the uh, ways which, uh, which may, you know, uh, uh, in, uh, embraces many difficulties and uh, dangers uh, in terms of, you know, uh, leading you to Allah. Uh, it may lead you to Allah, but it has its dangers, which you may just stick to this, uh, stick to that uh, metaphorical state and may not may not find a way to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, love of Allah. So the same is true for uh, for uh, Zuhre. Remember the journey of Zuhre and Katre and Rashha. Rashha seems uh, uh, to be a direct way to Tawheed. So it is a kind of, you know, jumping uh, toward, uh, uh, above, uh, jumping above, the Ma'anai Ismi uh, kind of, um, what can I say, Ma'anai Ismi faces of things. So you don't need to consider first Ma'anai Ismi of uh, uh, everything and then think about it, contemplate about it, and find the way uh, through Ma'anai Harfi. You just directly reach uh, and uh, think through Ma'anai Harfi, the glass of Ma'anai Harfi, if you uh, be uh, uh, you know uh, a traveler in the ro road of Reshha. Uh, what do you think about it? Okay. Thank you. Um, from what I understand, uh, my limited understanding, what Nurse is saying is that we need to understand our transitoriness. You need to know our own nature. We need to be become abd in order to understand. Uh, Allah, uh, we need to understand our own impermanence in order to get to permanence. We cannot jump into the kernel without going through to see what the shell is all about. So for me, that it's not something that we, we you're absolutely right, I agree, we cannot be, I mean, it's me, it's not a good position to be. <laughs> Allah says, you know, don't be a half horse, don't have, you know, must something be obviated. But 
it's also, we see that every example that's given in the Quran, even to prophets, is that Hosni is given to them. Why is Allah giving to them if it's so bad? Why is Allah putting them in these, in these situations where they will have Hosni? They will have Hosni, so they will get rid of Hosni. Uh, can you say this, Dr. Omeshit? Hosni is not something bad. It may be used as, uh, in a bad way. In, yeah, yeah. So it is, do not grieve, it says in the Quran. So you shouldn't do it. So, but we know that, you know, grief, that feeling of taqwa or feeling of hosn or things like that, we may be inclined towards it, but the giver of it is Allah. So why is Allah giving some, uh, something to us? Ahlan, ahlan, sukaina, ahlan. Ahlan, ahlan. Ah, sukaina. Sukaina. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. Yes, please okay. go ahead. So, uh, why is Allah giving us something and then say, don't have it? So, this then must have an aspect of it, which is a test, which is a form of guidance. And that has been the case for all the examples of the prophets in the Quran. It's been a form of guidance, starting right from Adam, right through. The parent fall is the way of to get up. So I can understand it. I understand it as a process. I don't know if that's answered your question. Yeah, okay, I think now uh, Dr. Ibrahim, he wants to ask a question. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Thank you very much for this uh, beautiful presentation. And I especially appreciate it uh, dealing with the problem started with the Quran and going through Al Kindi and through Islamic uh, history of uh, philosophy, how they, uh, some Muslim philosophers, they look at the problem. But uh, it was, you know, I think we, you, you reminded me one of the neglected uh, part of Ustad's life. Because Ustad, as far as I know, left his home and never seen his mother after he was 10 years old. But when we look at his life, he always feel this as a, uh, as a human being, he, he feels uh, this you know, in his heart. Even in some of his dreams, he's talking with his mother. Therefore, I think this is what is the, you know, uh, this uh, the, the impact of uh, start, uh, separation from his family, especially from his mother, has on him, and it is very instructive. He he, he reminds us very often the, the story of the Joseph and Jacob, alayhi salam, and so I think it starts overcome this human problem through 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 discovering a new way of uh, looking himself also. Uh, to the universe, and uh, because this husband and whatever we call it, it is a big problem. And the new age uh, understand they try to to overcome this with a pseudo spiritualism. But we start. I think when we talk about husband, also we have to remember uh, how he is talk about huzur uh, uh, to discover huzur, the happiness. Uh, it is opposite of the Hujun, with discovering the presence of Allah through the book of nature, to, to a deep reflection of nature. My question is uh, that uh, when you start try to overcome this, that let me say some personal, it is a personal problem as a lady, as a mother. What do you think about the, 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 the separation from his mother uh, almost when he was lecture and also psychological development? Thank you. Um, I think um, it, it's, it's very difficult. We know that uh, uh, Nursi was unhappy so many times. Um, separation of his mother, I can say as, as, as an analogy of one ver uh, one particular thing has come into my mind, which um, 
which really affected me a lot. When he got back and he was standing on a hill and he saw that his village, his home and everything was in ruin. He felt an immense hosen when he saw all his village. They, they totally destroyed his home and his whole village. And he looked at it and looked down and he saw, oh no, you know, he felt so much hosen. And then he describes that hosen as Gafla. He was heedless. He's sorry about his heedlessness. He takes recourse to Quran. And then he looks back and he looks sees things differently. He says, this is, it. this is not their doing. This is a missive. This is a letter from Allah to me. You know, and he reads it differently. This is Allah's plan. What's how, and he connects that situation to finding meaning in what he's seeing with disconnecting it from his own ownership and his own connection to his mother, his father, his family, his friends, and so on. So with regard to mother that you're talking about, he will see mother as shafaqat. He will see mother as, you know, he's a temporary rab when he was young, as nourishment, as nurture, and all the things of, that Allah has given to him. So he will see mother as a different kind of letter to be read. Father as a different kind of letter to be read and so on. Everything that happened to Noisi in his life is a different kind of letter. And then you to, and constantly he talks about his own heedlessness. It, it, the continuous description and analogies he uses in his description of what happened to him in his journey is of this, I've fallen, oh, I've seen wrongly, now I must see right. It gives an indication to me that there is that you can't help but have manna as me. We can't help but not see the kernel first before we uh, should see the shell first before we can get the kernel. How can we pierce through? This is the you know this is the, how this life is, and this is interesting because with regard to definition of happiness, he says about happiness. We was constantly talking about. You know, we you know we, we will have happiness in this world. You know, if we have, if we believe. But Nusi talks about two kinds of happiness. Of course, nesh e. One stimulates the nafs. You know, this is the nafsani. Uh, you know, the, the pleasures that we want to get, which he likens to a poisonous grape. Yes, it looks nice, tastes nice, but it poisons us afterwards. And the other, it silences it. It silences the nafs. It doesn't say you're going to be happy in this world. He said the other happiness silences it and urges it to attain to higher matters. This is what Nusi does. First, his nafs, when he discovered that his home is gone, his family, his friends, or you know, is destroyed. First, is uh, you know, he's destroyed. It's mine. Where is it gone? And then. The other kind comes and he, he, he tries to deal with that. Happiness is also, we can, the nature of this world is not, we cannot be happy as such because permanence is not the kind that we can get here in this world. Everything is impermanent. But we can get a kind of rather that we are satisfied. So we get a calmness and we're an understanding that there's permanence in the next world. So we become Ravi with being apt and waiting for that permanence in the next world. So with these people who are talking about, you know, you will be happy in this world. It's yes, thank shame. you very much. Uh, Sister Zina has a question written. Question, I would like to read it. Can we liken the relationship between Manai Ismi and Manai Harfi? To the law of duality that exists in the universe. Also, what is the relationship of al karab to al huzun according to Nursi? I also find it interesting that the collective grief experienced by many in these times of COVID-19 is related to the feeling of uncertainty and our movement away from a feeling of yaqeen. So you would like your comment on that also. A lot there. 
the law of duality. What do you mean exactly by law of duality? Hi, Dr. Manshed. Um, Hi. How are you doing? Uh, I just, uh, what I meant was the, the opposites, the, you know, the darkness versus light. Uh, and uh, as with every other law in the universe, um, I, the way I, because I usually, I haven't, when you mentioned the kernel and the, um, the kernel versus the shell, uh, I likened it a bit more to, um, the, I mean, having to, the opposites of the same, of the same thing. So the law of opposites, that's what I meant by the law of duality. Okay. Right. Um, well, there is, it's apparent opposite. Mm -hmm. So actually darkness doesn't exist as such as it, it's just less light. Mm -hmm. So the more we move away from belief, the less belief there will be. So there's no such ex exact opposites as such. So can we say man al-ismi is an illusion versus man al-harfi, which is the truth? Could you say it as in, I mean, the illusion, we've moved past the illusion of man al-ismi towards man al-harfi in a way, um, in the same way that there are also opposites. So they're opposites, but one is the absence of the other. It's, uh, Manus is, is the outer shell, so it exists, it's, 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 it, but it becomes a distorted view when we stay there and we don't give it meaning. We need to go beyond it and look for meaning. So if we st stop, I mean, we can't deny that Apple exists. It exists, okay? Mm -hmm. But we started thinking, well, they it created itself. We, we were stuck there. Now, I mean, we get all sorts of distorted ideas, which is, yeah. So we need to see, the, okay, what is, what is, the apple does exist, yeah. But what is, is this, uh, what is the apple telling us? What is, what's are this apple about? What is it created? What is the Quran talking about? Pomegranates and dates. You know, is it just nutrition, reduced as people write about to its nutritious value? No, of course it isn't. So Omicron states, all these are there. There are a manna, there are a letter. They're, yeah. they're, you know, the divine names for us to read. They're all about divine names. All right, thank you for that. So that was the, sorry, duality, relationship of al karab to mm -hmm. all, to al hos. What, 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 sorry, I don't know, what do you mean by al karab? Al karab um, is, um, I would say, calamity. Uh, I think the proper translation would be calamity, um, which it's, it's often uh, mentioned uh, with al huzn uh, Allahumma an al karab. Ah, yeah. So okay, definitely. When, when uh, okay, I, I, it's, uh, it's similar to fitna, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. So trials and tribulations that happen. Yeah. Yes. The idea of trial and tribulations. Yeah, the trials and tribulations are also a nema, a test and a form of guidance. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have to look at them as, as that way, as an Allah's mercy, that he is actually focusing us, our attention to these, so that we are read, to read what he's, it is his way of communicating to us, to shake us out of, us, out of our out of our ways, our habits and our habitual ways. So Hosn or, you know, these kind of calamities and fetna is a kind of shaking us out of ourselves and mm -hmm. waking us up into reality. So um, collective grief experience by many in these times is related to the meaning of uncertainty and our movement away from a feeling of yain. So what did you mean by just the last, your relation is good, now you're relating it to COVID-19. What are you saying in the last bit? Uh, in the last bit, I was, uh, I, I found that it's, it's interesting that as we move away from um, certainty, we feel depressed. And um, with this current situation, most people don't know what the future holds. Um, and the you know the collective grief we're all feeling, um, or a lot of a lot of us are feeling, is because of this uncertainty. So the more you move away from the feeling of uncertainty, the more you feel chazan and depression, uh, versus uh, you know you know having yaqeen, inner yaqeen. Um, yeah, I think uncertainty is a good state. We can never be certain about anything. That's being abd. 
that's being a servant of Allah. That's recognition of our impermanence. That's recognition of our uh, of our transitoriness, of our um, our uh, dependence, uh, how, what we are. And then trusting, then good, getting to know the one who isn't, the one who is permanent. So that state is actually a very good state to be in, to recognize who we are, what, what we're made of. Anyone who says this is certainty that's making me mm -hmm. feel better, I would, I would um, put a question mark out on that. I would say, no, uncertainty is a better state. Better state to be in. All right, mm -hmm. thanks. Okay, now uh, Nejati has a question and a comment to make. Nejati Oja, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for um, this very uh, good topic and discussion. Uh, I, I want to make a you know, comment uh, on mana, ismi mana, harfi, and also I think so, uh, it's, it's my understanding is that you link uh, mana, ismi to mulk and mana, harfi to malakut. And I think that mana ismi is related to the mulk, but is not equivalent to the mulk. Mana ismi that is basically when you make observation at the mulk dimension, that when you think what you observe is, is everything, so you ascribe those to cause or the nature, then become mana ismi. And for that, Nursi is very clear in my understanding, and that's a mistaken way of looking everything. So in that case, you know, I, I don't know whether it really is. Um, so I think what's, what's, what basically, uh, then there are two other concepts that you call dairi aspab and dairi itiqat. So dairi aspab in this case, again, is a mulk. And dairi itiqat is malakut. So, and he actually is very clear that we cannot ignore the dairi aspab. We live in dairi aspab. So which means that we have to follow this um, causal mechanism, even though we believe that the, the, the only cause is God, then everything else is just appearance, uh, you know, phenomena. So that's, in this regard, we can't really, we can ignore it, the, the milk dimension. But I think Gemana is me is related to the milk, but it's not exactly milk that's in, in, in my understanding. Now, how this is, uh, and the second issue that you link those two, again, how can linked to the Mana Harfi, I took from Anna that when we discussed before, that Nursi defined the self as the key to understand everything and including God. But to understand Anna, you need to really understand the true nature of Anna, which basically means to understand Ajd and Fakr. So to me, Huzn is a way to really understand your Ajd and Fakr. And when you understand your Ajd and Fakr, that basically means you understand your true nature, yourself, and then you can now, that means you look at yourself through Manai Harfi. And then once you read yourself through Manai Harfi, then you can actually look at, you can look at everything else in Manai Harfi as well. Because Nursi's judgment is the mistake began in looking at the self in Manai Ismi. And when you look at the self Manai Ismi, you just apply to everything else. So therefore, uh, it, then Manai Ismi is mistaken approach should not be used in any, in, in, in any way. Um, I think one thing I'm, I'm just curious as a question is this, um, Nusi used this Ashka Majazi and Ashka Haqiqi. And he asked this question, he said, is it necessary to actually have, or is it possible to have Ashka Majazi and then to go from there to go to Ashka Haqiqi? So in a way that's because uh, if we see Huzn a way of detachment, from what we love to a certain extent. But in that case, I'm just curious whether what you think on that part, because Nursi explicitly discussed this issue. I found that this very relevant to, to, to your topic. I'm, um, I'm curious about your um, comments on that. Thank you very much. Um, I agree. I, I don't think that uh, Manoy Ismi is exact in the definition of Mulk or Manoy Hafi, the exact definition of Malakut. Totally agree with that, but there is a connection between them in, in the way that it, it, it's a process. What, what I'm thinking about Manoy Ismi is that, that just as in Anna is, is describing that just at the, 
and it's also is linked probably with, uh, to your this metaphorical love and beloved love. So just as I, in Anna says, just as I own this house, then I have to get through that process before I understand the whole concept of ownership. And then say, come to say, oh, then uh, something bigger than me must have created the universe. Then I go back to my first position and realize that my first position was a man, oh, yeah, it's me position. I owned it. I said, I own this house. I have to then realize, actually, no, I, I didn't build this house. All my faculties were given to me. So I understand Anna, the understanding of man, oh, yeah, it's man, oh, yeah, through Anna. Through notice, Anna. So it's a process that we, we go. So uh, this metaphorical beloved that we talk about, and the um, what was the other one, uh, and the Hakiki beloved. How can we get to suddenly jump to you know? This is the born Muslim idea. You know, I believe in Allah because my mother told me. No, we need to go through the process that Abraham went through. We need to understand the shellness of the shell. And, and, and it does and I totally agree with you. Man, is it's not good. It's not a good place to be. It's a passing stage, it's a process. So I totally agree with you on that. But it's impossible to jump a step into Man Harfi without going through the process of Man me. It, 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 I see it as a process. Okay, thank you very much. We have another written question I would like to ask. Uh, uh, I would like to read uh, what is the connection between compassion and huzun? Also, is huzun a pain or pleasure or both? A positive or negative experience? As in the story of Yaqub alayhi salam. Well, it's certainly a painful process, <laughs> but it's um, Nusi describes two kinds of uh, hosnas we've uh, we've described. Uh, the first one is apparently negative. The second one, positive. But we see actually, and he did, he relates the first one. He's seeing things in the wrong way, and he relates the first one with being in a reflex situation, heedless situation. But then. He seems to describe his own journey as if the, you know, he experienced the first kind of host. And this makes me question, if Nursi went through this kind of host, if the Jacob, Hazrat Yaqub, went through this kind of host, then is it bad? Or is it a necessary, desirable? Is it a process that we need to go through? So actually, First bad one isn't bad either, unless you stay there. That would be my answer. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, there are just a few comments, but uh, we can check on. Main, yeah, Professor Wafi joined us. Welcome, Professor. Uh, I just want to uh, welcome also Professor Abdul Aziz Barghouth. Uh, most welcome from uh, Malaysia Islamic University and Edward Moad also from Qatar. So if they want to say something, please go ahead. Otherwise, uh, I think uh, things are finished. If anybody else, any other comments, you know, that you want to make, uh, just uh, let me give you first just brief information about this uh, seminars. We Uncertainty in, in today's uh, age, especially in this pandemic period. Um, so the, the challenge to us is to be, to be able to show how bringing Nursi's notion of host, for example, can be um, uh, articulated in, for example, in terms of the notion of collective grief that is different from what is already articulated in the, you know, the current uh, scholarship. And the same thing I would say goes for all the other concepts that we are speaking about from uh, from Nursi. This is uh, very good. I think uh, the, the comments also, uh, Sister Nadina also, uh, you know, brought uh, another aspect, uh, the uh, losing of certainty, yaqeen, 
because you see uh, the situation today, we don't know what will happen. We are all, uh, you know, we remained in utter uh, suspicion. Should we do this? We cannot plan anything for the future. It has become totally, you know, uh, an uncertain uh, situation. So uh, th this is also very much important and it should be analyzed, I think. If anybody wants to say anything on this, uh, please go ahead. Uh, Alaikum uh, Salam. Uh, yes, Prof. Actually, last week I had a talk with uh, uh, Sister Shumaila as well as uh, Dr. Hakan, Hakanabe that for the next or the coming uh, graduate conference, I was suggesting that um, now in, in accordance with um, COVID-19, if we can have the concept of something like Husnuddan, a uh, positive thinking of uh, uh, Ustad Nursi to be the team. So yeah. maybe this one can not eliminate the husn. <laughs> husn is there, but we are trying to take uh, more verses on, like, let's say, for example, when Imam, uh, when Ustad Nursi was in the jail, he, he was always having a positive thinking, a husnodan that, oh, alhamdulillah, I'm in Madrasa Yusufiya. And uh, when he was, um, um, you know, like um, put in very remote area that nobody would see him or meet him and who would be happy because this is a good thing. This is a good opportunity that I can contemplate uh, more and to be close to Allah even more. So, I mean, like there is like no husband. <laughs> yes. It's uh, everything is just good in its own way. <laughs> um, any idea, Prof, about the team for the graduate conference that maybe it's in, uh, there is a relationship with what we are talking about today? Yeah, at the moment, uh, I don't know uh, if any planning, but uh, I just see a comment made here by Colin. He says, in the past, we already had uh, a conference on positive thinking. A symposium theme it was already mentioned so uh, but in any case you know this time maybe in relation to these uh, of course uh, I wanted to say you know negative concept but it has positive aspect also as already mentioned in, in, the, in the talk so uh, that you know the positive thinking positive action in relation to concepts that have negative meaning or something like that. Maybe that would be a good topic, uh, you know, for the future graduate conference, inshallah. Oh, I'm just gonna come on here in response to Brother Alatas. Um, yes. I think it's important to, what we get from Nursi, which is really important is that Hosni is not something bad, it's, you know, that you just need what's happening now is a different kind of sorrow is to do with loss. So it's not a, uh, you know, endogenous depression or stress. And it is put, it is put into that category in America. It is put under endogenous uh, depression, Hosn, deep Hosni has to do with loss. And they are, they are treating this with medication. That they're making a lot of profit out of this too. So what's, how, what Nursi is saying different here is that, no, this is not to do with medication. And this is, this is not a bad place to be. It's a place of Rahma, it's a place of mercy, it's a place to read, but you read it. It's shaking you to look at something beyond what it is. So then if we understand this, there's a purpose to this. Our world, this world of psychiatry, interprets this as a bad situation to get rid of. Nursi says this is a temporary, is a good situation. Read, it, read beyond what it is. Don't connect it to your now. See what the purpose of it is. And, how, and he teaches us how to see what the purpose of it is through his own life journey. He talks about divine names and he talks about letter and missive and we need to follow that process. 
to get out of Oz, to get to Manor a halfway stage. So he does provide the remedy and he does point where it's wrong and how we should follow. But I, had, I didn't go to detail on this. It's not like me. Can, can I just respond? Oh. Yes, please, please. Uh, I just just to um, to ask uh, to get clarification from uh, uh, Mashid Khanum. Um, from what you said, are you saying that um, Mursi that would not or does not or did not recognize the 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 category or the idea or the phenomenon of clinical depression? I, were you saying that he is saying that uh, what in the West is regarded as clinical depression and can be cured through drugs and so on and so forth doesn't exist? It's all husp? Um, or what, how, how, how would Nursi um, you know, deal with the issue of clinical depression? Right. I did not cover clinical depression because host is not doesn't come under the umbrella of clinical depression. Clinical de de depression is to do with organic, physical, and it's a different. And he would definitely probably say that it's uh, that it's to do with a physical thing, and it is to be treated with medication. But the word host is doesn't come under the umbrella of clinical depression. It comes it comes under under of umbrella of reactive depression, which is environmental which is to do with loss, the idea of loss. So this is the area that I've covered. And it's actually, but what's happening is that this hosen, the idea of loss, is, is actually being treated with medication. It's in the wrong category. Certainly in, a, in, in, the, in the DS thing of America, it's put in the wrong category because of lack of understanding. Okay, I think... Uh... Ed wants to say something. Edward? Oh, uh, the last question sort of altered the context, <laughs> which I was, um, yeah. So I guess I was thinking about the, um, the difference between what I take to be what Norsi has to say here. And I'm sorry, I only got into the last bit and I didn't hear your whole discussion, so I probably am not in a place to, to, to really comment or ask any question. But I think uh, clearly from what you what I've heard you say so far, um, Nursi isn't really just thinking about um, a feeling or talking about this in a therapeutic sense, but really this has to do with a person's um, conception of reality, right? So it's not just a, a matter of positive thinking in the sense that we are kind of sold, as you can, you know, as, as you as you uh, noted, right? Um, it's not just thinking positively, but it's actually thinking that you know uh, there is a God and <laughs> right uh, things are created by God for a purpose, and that you can find you know what I mean a purpose in whatever that you're suffering, which is quite a bit more cognitive work, right, than than just a promotion of, of, of positive thinking, which may be something that could be attached to any kind of ontology, with any kind of worldview, regardless. I mean, absolute atheists could, could claim to get through life through positive thinking, and that would be a completely different thing, right? So I guess that led me to, the reason I was thinking about that was because the idea of collective grief was mentioned, and what I've been thinking about in the midst of the pandemic was um, the fact of how this pandemic is forcing us to collectively uh, regard certain, certain questions and issues. And in this case, if we talk about the suffering or the worry with the pandemic, we have some kind of collective grief about how collective can it be when people, let's say, differ on basic questions like what is essential what kinds of things need to be kept open, what kinds of things are life for, and what kinds of things are not worth risking life for. I mean, those are basic moral questions. Those moral questions will be different, and they will correspond to completely different worldviews. And that seems to me to mean that the nature of the grief that is suffered by people who would answer that question differently is actually quite different. And so that makes me wonder how collective the grief really is. 
or to what extent it's actually just uh, the fact that many people are suffering a kind of a private grief, yeah? Um, and if we have a collective way to deal with the grief, then it requires a collective understanding about what the grief means, what the suffering means, and that requires a, a, a collective theology, let's say. Um, I, I don't know if that, <laughs> this is how it, it kind of came to my, uh, the thoughts that come to my mind regarding the pandemic. Um, sorry, actually, I don't know how relevant that was to the what was what has come before. But I'll stop. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I think the important thing is that looking at Noah's life, and he goes through the most of Rasale talking about the kind of sorrows that or the kind of experiences that he had experienced personally, and then he examines those personal experiences in uh, in with with his own nafs, how he feels, his immediate feelings. Oh my home, I lost my wife, I lost this, and and then he tries to then instead of putting his own nafsi criteria in, in, in order to understand the situation he takes recourse to the truths of the quran so he uses the criteria of the quran to reinterpret the situation so his journey consists of looking at the phenomena looking at what's happening seeing what's happening and then it, the feelings it has on him how it affects him and then he doesn't like those feelings. He makes a kind of introspection in there. Why am I feeling like this? How should I be feeling? Then he connects it to the creator at this stage, to the criteria of the Quran, then goes back to the phenomena and reinterprets the situation in accordance to the criteria of the Quran. And this is our journey. He teaches us through his own journey to follow the same process. What's happening here? How am I seeing this? How is it affecting me? This is how it's affecting my, uh, and my nafs is getting angry, this and, and so on. And then now I, is this how am I supposed to be? What's the criteria of the Quran? Goes back to the Quran, goes back to the phenomena and reinterprets the situation. And this is, this is all we can do. And collective grief is because we are using the same kind of language that's been told to, to us, the same kind of discourse. For example, COVID-19 is bad, we are insecure, we, we, we are we're engaging in the same language. Let's get out of there for a bit. Let's, let's, as believers, get out and see what's the language of the Quran in this situation. What can we see from a different perspective that's not nafsani, that's not egoistic? What's the true picture of things as far as we can understand? It will always be subjective because it's our understanding. But at least we are using the Quran of the Quran, not our own nafs. And then going back to the scenario and reinterpreting. So we can, as believers, have that collective understanding, but not on not when we are using the same language, the present language, it's an SV and Nafsi interpretation. I don't know if that's... Thank you very much. I think um, if there is no other comments, uh, we can stop here uh, and we'll see you inshallah next time in two weeks. There will be uh, another topic that is related to this, but then the approach will be from more theological aspect, inshallah. Uh, so uh, anybody wants to make any comment or say anything? Just is there a schedule of the talks that online or something? Yes, we will uh, we will send you inshallah. Okay, well, uh, Hakan, uh, brother Hakan is uh, in charge of that. He's at the moment still in the process, not uh, clearly, you know, not exactly done, but inshallah within a few uh, days or so, we will have a, a fixed schedule, we'll send it to, to you inshallah. And if you suggest anything, please uh, let us know, uh, so you can make your presentation also. And uh, Sister Nadina has a, a comment here. In the Damascus sermon, Ustaz Nursi speaks of the sickness of the human state of despair and hopelessness, could this be reference to collective grief? 
and she's also thanking uh, Dr. Mahjid for this nice, uh, great talk. Okay. Yes, um, yes, please. I think um, I didn't actually use, um, is it Hasteris, I yes. see. Uh, yeah, so I didn't, I didn't actually use that because it wasn't directly related to us. So it's about sickness and the futility of worrying. It was less about something that happened in the past, but the futility of something, worrying about something that hasn't actually happened yet, mostly in the sickness herself. Yes. So it's slightly different, but uh, with regard to collective grief, grief, uh, if you're thinking in terms of hosn, it's something that's happened in the past. So, uh, and you're grieving over. So if it's to do with anxiety about the future, again, it's, it'll be a different term, terminology that would, uh, okay. Nursi will be using. So, so yeah. thank you very much. Uh, uh, I don't see any other comments, so I think... Uh, yeah, just just brief, brief, brief comments, I think, I can, if I can make it. Okay, okay. Uh, Necati Hocam, yeah, buyur. I think so. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, Sister Machine emphasized a lot in terms of necessity of hizm and importance of hizm. Um, so in a sense that it's somehow is part of life and it's given for good reason. So I think that's part it is, uh, it, you know, the question is like, a, it's like, a, it's, I kind of consider like being feel, feeling of hunger that you feel hungry and thirsty, and then you can actually go and find food and appreciate that. So in a sense that when you experience something, when she mentioned, let's say something happened to you, first you look at in a mistaken way, you let's say feel pain and you go and reflect on it, then you see the good side. So like in a sense, when I look at it, uh, yes, uh, that you somehow need to feel to a certain extent this, this feeling of, let's say, uh, loss and despair to a certain extent, that will make you to search for the way to really, you know, overcome that. So it seems like in one way, that let's say we have all this adversity in life, failure in life. So what the way she, she looked at it, I think it's, uh, it's interesting that it's, it's just part of life. So we're going to uh, you know, uh, in this case, uh, basically experience something that give us reason because that is the way for us to really um, somehow find, you know, find God and, and make connection. So I think, I, I used to think a lot on this uh, subject as well, in a sense, that is it really, yeah, can we yeah, have a, a problem-free or reason-free life um, that's, so it seems like, and I, yeah, that's basically my, my personal judgment as well, it seems like this is just part of life, no matter what. Um, so we are going to experience a, a sort of, you know, prison or sort of, you know, a pain in life and uh, the, or feeling of loss. The question here is, um, it's, it seems like nothing wrong at the first dance, maybe as a human being to cry or to somehow feel despair. But when you look through um, the Tabhid uh, and Rububiyya perspective, you can and you should overcome that feeling uh, in, and what he defines as Manai Aismi, and then look through the Manai Harfi and, and, and learn uh, you know, a positive lesson. And I think as um, Ed mentioned, it's quite different than, uh, you know, in the modern psychology, when say, they say that, you know, just try to have a positive perspective. This is, is not about pers perspective, it's about, it seems like, your understanding of reality that you see, uh, ontologically speaking, whatever is happening is ultimately is good, is happening for good reason. So it's not that let's, let's just look at it as if it is good, no, it actually, you somehow, you can, um, you, if you can gain this, you know, mana harfi perspective, you can see it is in, in fact good for you. There is goodness in that. That's how maybe you can overcome and make connection to God. That's, that's my, my take on that. I don't know. 
Yeah, I mean, can you just say you can't? It's you can't get a state the way you can't have host. You will always have host. Either you'll have the first kind or the second kind. You'll have the you can have the orphan-like state where you feel totally disconnected, or you will have host where there is you 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 will be separated from your friends. Yes, but there's a recognition that you will meet them in the next world. You don't feel disconnected. So that state is a rahman anyway. But we may have to move on to that second state. Thank you. Yes. So thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, now we want to stop here. Hakan, do you want to say something? No, I think we are fine. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will uh, edit this video and upload it uh, on YouTube uh, for uh, those who couldn't attend today. Uh, and our next uh, meeting, uh, for our next uh, schedule, I will send an email to the participants. Okay, inshallah. Have you taken uh, the note from Prof. Abdul Aziz? He, he wants to give a seminar also. Yes, I will connect him. Also, uh, I will connect uh, Professor Alatas. Uh, and uh, it is open to uh, everybody for uh, you know to do a presentation okay that's very good so thank you very much in that case we will see you all next time inshallah uh assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh